Uh, welcome, everyone. I um, want to thank you all for joining us. We're excited to offer uh, this two part permaculture uh, principles um, workshop, a webinar session. Uh, it's something that we've had a lot of interest in, uh, both for this session in particular and, and just in general. So we're glad to be able to offer it. Um, we're going to be uh, addressing uh, in this first part uh, some introductions, principles, and all of that. We're going to follow up with the second half on Thursday evening at the same time. Um, a couple of nuts and bolts things. Uh, I'm Dan Dalton. I'm the, the Western Regional uh, Representative for PASA. On, us, on the call here with us as well is Christina Kostalecki. Uh, she's going to be helping with technology and, and troubleshooting anything like uh, issues. So uh, if you are having any technical issues and you're able to hear us, please do communicate that to Christina. You can use the chat box um, or uh, if you need to, if you do get booted out, you can use email to either myself or to Christina. We're monitoring those throughout just to make sure everyone um, is, has access. We will also be recording this session so uh, and it will be released in the future. So you will have access to it uh, further down the line uh, in, in a few months. Um, we will be uh, at the end of the session. We'll be dropping a uh, an evaluation link into the chat box. We do ask that it's just a few simple questions. We do ask that you fill that out. It helps us with grant reporting, uh, tracking, and planning future events. It really does uh, mean a lot to to our work. So we'd ask you to take just a moment to fill that out. Um, we are obviously, I think. Everyone's getting pretty familiar with Zoom. Uh, everyone is on mute at this point. We ask that you do remain on mute. Uh, if you're comfortable having your video on, it does sometimes help speakers just to get a little head nod to know that you're following along or having a quizzical look if uh, if something doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you're already, right, <laughs> that's right, I see one there. Um, if you're comfortable, uh, feel free to do that. If not, uh, don't worry. Um, but do keep your your volume on, or your yourself on mute throughout. Uh, if we do get down to the end and there is a particular question that we want to address that has some texture to it, we may unmute individuals, but we'll take that on a case by case basis. We will be accepting questions throughout uh, via the chat box. So if you have a question, please do feel, feel free to put it in there. Uh, however, we will be holding till the end of each of the speakers uh, presentations so that we're able to um, give them the, the space. There's a lot of material here. There's a lot of, uh, lot of things to cover and they may be addressing it later in their, in their remarks anyway. So we'll give them that space. Um, with all of that being said, I want to yeah welcome you again, and I want to hand it over to our three presenters this evening, uh, Daryl Fry of uh, Three uh, Three Sisters Permaculture, uh, Elizabeth Lynch of Three Sisters Permaculture, and the Garfield Community Farm, and John Creasy of the Garfield Community Farm as well. Let's say welcome. Hello. Elizabeth, did you want? There you go. Hey, everybody. So my name is Elizabeth, and I am part of the Three Sisters teaching team, and I also am the production um, production manager at, at Garfield Community Farm in Pittsburgh. Um, a little bit about my background and myself. I got into permaculture when I was in college. I started um, to hear the word and got curious about it. So I studied as much as I could about it. And I took my permaculture design certificate course in, that was probably 2003 in Hawaii and got to learn a little bit about subtropical um, systems and plants. And then from there, I took a teacher training and I took a, um, a forest garden design training and I started teaching small introduction courses. I had, I had been teaching um, environmental education for a long time before that already. And um, my college degrees in wildlife science and ecology. So I, I started teaching little introductory courses and then doing some design work and worked my way up to teaching full um, permaculture design courses. Um, so I have a lot of experience in ecology and research, um, a little bit in farming and a lot in education. That's a little bit about myself. Um, John, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. Glad you're all here. Um, it's a it's, uh... Good to see you. It'd be fun to be in person, but we can't do that right now. Um, I uh, am 
the founder and director of Garfield Community Farm, a little uh, two and a half acre farm at the top of uh, a hill called Garfield, a neighborhood called Garfield here in Pittsburgh. Um, it is an urban neighborhood. It is a largely um, uh, a neighborhood that, that has seen a lot of abandonment, a largely abandoned urban neighborhood. So it's about half its population that it was 30, 40 years ago. Um, so we've been working there for uh, a little over 12 years now, and Daryl and Liz have both put their fingerprint on the farm in very big ways. It's it's really great to be able to do these sorts of things with them, two people who have really influenced and continue to influence the work of the farm. Um, I'm the pastor of a church called The Open Door that's also in Garfield. Um, I have three kids, and we live one neighborhood over in a neighborhood called Stanton Heights. Okay. Am I on next then? Hello, everybody. I'm Daryl Fry, and I think I want to start my screen share right away, if that works. Um, so let's see if this works out. Um, get this started and then I'll start talking here a little bit. Whoops. Okay, are we looking at the screens? Um, yes, again, I'm Daryl Fry. I started studying permaculture as early as 1980, which is 40 years. So, um, what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna give my background and then I'm gonna give a little bit about the background of permaculture. Uh, Liz is gonna talk about what permaculturists do a little bit and some other background information. And then John's gonna present about his work. And then in the end, I have more to present um, about residential permaculture if we get to it. Um, so, I was, uh, when I was 19 years old, I got a country farm and started homesteading, um, remodeled an old farmhouse, didn't do a major remodel, but made it livable, an abandoned house. And my neighbors were all homesteaders raising goats and chickens and teaching me how to compost and raise bed gardens. And it's just a really good neighborhood to move into and started cutting my own wood and firewood and reading Mother Earth News Magazine. And I, I read this article um, about permaculture and um, just uh, really decided that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a permaculturist. And eventually about 10 years later, I started my farm, Three Sisters Farm and my permaculture design business, Three Sisters Permaculture. Three sisters are corn, beans, and squash, which are grown together as companion plants, um, main crops of the Iroquois Indians in our region. I'm an author of two books, one, Bioshelter Market Garden, about my farm, um, Three Sisters Farm, and the Food Forest Handbook I co-authored with Michelle Zolba. We're talking more about food forests um, Thursday night. Um, and, you know, for 25 years, I grew produce and sold it to restaurants in Pittsburgh from my farm, intensive market gardening. And my goal is to develop a permaculture farm um, to bring these permaculture principles to Western Pennsylvania. I'm semi-retired from that now. I do a lot of design and consulting and education, but I'm not currently market gardening. My introduction to permaculture I read this interview of Bill Mollison in Mother Earth News Magazine in 1980. And in this book, Mollison, the Plowboy interview, in the, in the, not the book, excuse me, in the Mother Earth News article, he described permaculture as a integrated self-sustaining system of perennial agriculture involving a large diversity of plants and animals, a self-contained ecosystem to design to minimize maintenance input and maximize product yield. 
But what really struck me in this interview was when he said that what he wanted was trying to do was apply the principles of environmental science to our production systems to create ecological agriculture systems. And uh, he described permaculture and the networking he was starting to do. So I was inspired and I bought his first two books, Permaculture One and Permaculture Two. And those um, really laid out permaculture. Um, the book Permaculture One was kind of the master's thesis of this David Holmgren, a student of Bill Mollison's. And they laid out the concepts and early principles of permaculture. Permaculture Two, the next book in the series more elaborated on what permaculture was, principles and applications and farming techniques and water management and just started getting into a lot more details. And those two books, I don't think they're in print anymore, but they were synthesized into the introduction to permaculture, which is still in print. So those are kind of the three introductory texts. Um, and then Mollison later, 10 years later wrote Permaculture, a guide, practical guide for a sustainable future. And this is like the manual for permaculture design courses and teachers. It's a very thick book. It's got a lot of details, a lot of philosophy, a lot of information on design. So if you're really interested in pursuing permaculture design, um, this book by Mollison is kind of the textbook. And uh, then years later, David Holmgren, while Bill Mollison was out preaching the, the word of permaculture around the world, traveling the world and giving courses and creating permaculture courses and giving lectures and um, getting involved in many product, projects, David Holmgren decided he needed to really put his college ideas into practical work on his own land and his own consultancy. And it was about 20 years later that he finally um, published his book, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability. And this is the book that really helped bring permaculture into the mainstream by um, laying out the permaculture principles in a really easy to follow format. So, um, so that's kind of a really quick brief history. Permaculture is a system of ecological design. We study ecology, we study environmental science, we study native agricultural systems, and we try to create um, productive systems, low energy input, appropriate scale, and so forth. Um, Liz, can I turn this over to you now? Sure. Yeah, I like to think about permaculture as, you know, if living in Pennsylvania, if we just let our landscape go and didn't do anything, it would turn into a forest and that forest would be able to um, shed leaves to build soil fertility. Uh, it would produce all the food that all of the animals that live in that area need. So thinking about how to mimic that natural system and the natural cycles to be able to provide food for humans in an environmentally friendly way is just really a fascinating concept. And there are so many different avenues that permaculture takes. So there's food production and there's perennial food production, but there's a lot of work that can be done in other areas too. So normally when people take a permaculture design course, they're thinking about either, well, what can I do with my backyard? I'd like to design my backyard to be productive and healthy and sustainable. So they're, they're the home designers. Um, that's one avenue. Another avenue is that sometimes people want to do design work professionally. So they would take their permaculture course and then practice designing and and get competent, build up their competencies until they could do design work for pay um, and, and design permaculture systems for other people. Another avenue that people take is to teach permaculture. So once you learn about it, you could share that information with other people. 
And one of the permaculture principles is um, slow and small solutions. So you start small with what you know, and then you build from there. And I'd like to even say that there's so much opportunity for other permaculture related jobs at this point, and, and we really need it. So um, permaculture has taken on a whole other life besides just growing perennial foods into renewable energy systems, natural building, um, water systems, catching and storing water, using the water from the rain through our landscape. So there are really a lot of opportunities for creating permaculture job niches. Um, there is a huge need locally for useful plants. So thinking about nurseries and plant stocks and then thinking about seed banks and seed libraries and how to share that with each other. So um, those are just a couple of ideas, but permaculture is also whole systems thinking, um, which we could definitely use a lot more of in our whole culture and being trained in permaculture and thinking about that and taking that into government and into any kind of field is definitely useful. Um, so there are national and local organizations for permaculture. There's a national organization called PINA or the Permaculture Institute of North America. And Daryl is a board member and I'm a staff member and the Permaculture Institute um, holds a standard for permaculture education and they offer diploma programs in, in these various fields for site design education, um, regenerative land management. So that, that's one avenue of, of furthering your education and work and getting certified in doing that. They also offer um, different webinars. I, I believe that there's gonna be one coming up in January about um, mutual aid and social permaculture and working together. Um, and then in, there, in Pennsylvania, I know out in Philadelphia, there is the Eastern PA Permaculture Guild in Pittsburgh, that's um, a much more well-organized group of permaculturists than we have in Pittsburgh. It's more decentralized. It's not quite very well organized yet, but there is the Three Rivers Permaculture Guild. Um, and there's a Mid-Atlantic Permaculture Convergence coming up in December if you're interested in taking, taking part in that also. And then Daryl and John and I are gonna be offering a permaculture design course at Garfield Community Farm most likely in August. So if you want more information about that, you can check with us later about that. Great. Um, guess we could move into urban permaculture. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, this picture, by the way, is our last year's permaculture class at Garfield Community Farm with proper social distancing. Um, yeah, the we, year we, we were all together, like arms around each other. But this is a great picture showing how to do a course during a pandemic. OK, I'm going to stop screen sharing and turn this over to John. And I will start sharing. Um, so what I'm going to hmm begin with here is, or get into here is the, the ethics and principles of permaculture. And these are one one real take at the principles of permaculture. There are, I mean, we could, we could think about this for a few hours and come up with a new principle that we all agree on and, and go with it. And that could be great. And there are different permaculturists out there who have developed different sets of principles. What I'm going to be going through are the 12 that David Holmgren uh, came up with. So Daryl has, has mentioned uh, Bill Mollison, who was the professor um, of David Holmgren. They worked together. So this is uh, these will be from David Holmgren's work. And there we go. Uh, a few pictures. I, I like pictures, so I'm going to show a couple here before I even get started. Um, the uh, the top right corner is Daryl's bio shelter, which I'm sure you're going to see more of on Thursday. But the reason I show it here at the beginning is it really influenced our time spent there a decade ago 
um, when Daryl was really, uh, really involved as a, a market gardener, a farmer, um, really shaped what we do now in Garfield. Um, so on the bottom left corner is a photo from Garfield Community Farm. Our, our bio shelter that's about a tenth the size, <laughs> I don't know, much smaller than Daryl's bio shelter in Three Sisters, at Three Sisters Farm. Um, an example of design work that we do. Some definitions. I'm going to skip over these, these because Daryl's already, I think, given a couple of these. And these are the ethics of permaculture. So for us, um, those of us who practice permaculture, sometimes it, it takes, you know, stepping back a little bit to recognize that there are these three ethics that really, um, that really guide what we do in permaculture. And if you're doing, if you're doing work that kind of fits into one of these, but you, you really, you know, you're doing uh, earth care, but you're really not growing food and you're not working with people. In some ways, that's not not quite permaculture. Um, if you're able to bring these things together, it's really what permaculture is all about, is bringing together things that in the past have been seen as separate. And that is caring for the earth, caring for people, seeing that happening in a way that is inextricable, and then doing that in a way that um, all elements within, within your permaculture system gets what it needs uh, in, a, in a fair and equi equitable way. So fair share, earth care, people care, and fair share. I like to use the word justice where fair share is seen. Um, that uh, one element in a system doesn't get an abundance of something more than it needs at the expense of something else in a system. So we're looking to create closed loop systems where everything is functioning with everything that it needs to be holistic, healthy, and abundant. So with those ethics, I'm pretty charged up and like ready to go. I, I love the ethics of permaculture. Um, and then, it, I mean, from there, it just gets exciting. How are we going to how are we going to put these things into practice? The three things that I care deeply about. And I, I think you probably do, too. So David Holmgren, um, from there, uh, created these 12 principles. You can see the ethics are right at the center. One step out are the 12 principles, the ways of practicing permaculture, the principles that guide the practice. And so from there, we can take a step out again and we can see what do those principles end up affecting in practical hands-on ways? Well, most of what it is to live a human life <laughs> can be affected by permaculture, our food, our shelter, energy, ethics again, climate, water, soil, and we could add things to that. So permaculture goes from when we enter into it, oftentimes we're thinking of our backyard of gardening. Yes, but it's it becomes much bigger um, when we allow the ethics to really influence all aspects of what it is to live a human life. Um, and do it in a way that is regenerative and restorative to the earth and to culture. So the first principle, I'm just going to go through these quickly um, so that we have some time for questions at the end. I'm going to keep an eye on the time. Uh, observe and interact. Um, so when we're working on a, on a piece of land, it's often really easy to just jump in with what we what, what a, like if we're getting paid to do a design, all three of us do design work for people and people oftentimes think they know what they want. Um, they want a greenhouse and they want it here. Um, and a permaculturist will, will take some time on that property and, and find uh, that maybe that greenhouse doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work in that space because there's a big oak tree that would need to be cut down. You know, simple things of observe, what is already happening on a piece of land. Um, so the two photos I have there, of course, the left, there's a praying mantis um, in the nasturtiums. We were, that year we were growing a big 
big old pile of nasturtiums and selling those flowers and, and putting the leaves in our salad mix. And there were lots of little tiny black aphids. And um, if we had not been observing what was happening there, we probably would have sprayed some soap on the aphids or, or maybe something stronger. But we realized, oh, there's, there are some praying mantises in there doing, doing what, uh, what they do, <laughs> eating insects. There are some places where we may, might not want uh, an abundance of praying mantis, but in this patch of nasturtiums, they were, um, they were the ecological fix to what was already happening there. So we had done something right um, by creating a, a little mini ecosystem where praying mantises could thrive and, and solve some of our insect problems. Um, we also, in observing, are always looking at water. This is just an example of a hillside where we, we saw that we had a lot of erosion. Um, so we dug some very shallow swales on contour and, and we filled it with some hose water and we just watched to see what would happen. Could that fix a problem? Um, that's the interact part. We had observed that there was a problem with erosion. Let's take some interaction and see if a larger interaction would, would be an appropriate interaction. So a small, slow step, a, a small step to see if a larger step is appropriate. <clears throat> Observing um, some hillsides, this is in Mexico. Daryl and I have done some work together. Um, with uh, a doctor in a rural village in central Mexico. We, we've uh, planted um, many, many fruit trees with farmers there. And you can see on that hillside, there's a field. So down in the low area that's all lush and green, that's where the quote Mexican farmers are. And on the upper hillsides are where the indigenous farmers um, are forced to farm. So they have a village that's in the in the valley, but they aren't allowed to farm because the, to farm the valley because it's all owned by um, non-indigenous people, non-indigenous farmers who've taken the best land. So they're forced to be um, way up at the top. And you can see the gray of those fields. So we have, did a lot of observing of what was going on there. This is uh, one of the ways that we helped um, some farmers on their on those hillsides was to take those rocks and dig shallow swales and plant fruit trees um, where they had quit growing corn and beans um, because it had just become too eroded. So um, so along some of those hills now uh, we've helped those farmers um, develop some some food forests. Um, aching to get back there. It's been a few years. I think Daryl and I were there five years ago. It was the last time we were there. But you can see the work that we were doing um, to get those trees on those contour lines. The second principle is catch and store energy. Um, and we want to think big about these principles. It's easy to think catch and store energy um, in one way, but there, there's just a multiplicity of ways that we can think about catching and storing energy. So with a bio shelter, there are many ways that we're catching and storing energy. Um, you can see it with the solar panels. Um, the bio shelter, I call it a big battery. It It's charged in the sunlight. The inside gets very warm on a day like in this photo. And then at night, the battery uses that energy. It kind of releases that energy slowly overnight and it's recharged again in the daytime the next day. Um, ben Falk is a... a farmer and permaculture educator in Vermont. I love this quote that he has. Um, We've yet to invent a better way to store energy than in a well-stacked wood pile. Um, that's my son, Micah, in front of our wood pile at home. So our, our urban backyard does a lot for us and um, we heat our house with wood. And um, that wood is absolutely essential to our well-being. So if we don't stack and cover that wood well, um, we're in trouble. <laughs> um, so, uh, yep, that wood pile right now in our backyard is very big and full and it's a lot of energy ready to uh, provide for us all winter long. Um, swales and water are a, a source of, of energy. This is a, 
photo of a pretty steep hillside and if that water were just rushing down the hill it would be taking soil with it but by creating swales we slow down that water we reduce um we reduce runoff and and store the energy of the water in the soil instead of uh allowing that energy to the energy of gravity really to take that water away from us um, and that water can be used by plants because it's stored in the soil the third principle is obtain a yield. I love this one because, uh, especially in the early years of Garfield Community Farm, it really guided us to, to not only observe, but to grow some food first thing. Like, okay, we can, we can build a raised bed. We're not gonna damage anything by growing a little bit of food while we do our observing and interacting and moving slowly. And we can get that food to people in the neighborhood to show that we're we're serious about this project and we're gonna do it. Uh, we're gonna grow food. So we did that from year one. Um, whatever you do in permaculture, you need to be uh, creating a yield for humanity because we can't fix our ecological problems if we ignore the needs of humanity. We're not pure environmentalists we're environmentalists and humanitarians at the same time. Um, and so we believe that by, uh, by solving the problems of need that humans have, we can also solve the ecological problems of our planet. So it was really great. One year we planted all these flowers all over the farm. Elizabeth did that and she's in that photo there, a different Elizabeth than Elizabeth Lynch. <laughs> this was a few years ago. And Elizabeth planted these flowers and she uh, she thought she was just planting them for pollinators. And then one day we were a little low for our CSA and she was like, well, let me just see what flowers we have. We've been attracting beneficial insects all over the farm all summer long. I think I can get, a, get, get some flower bouquets. And I remember she walked into the garden with this giant armful of just absolutely beautiful flowers. Um, an unexpected yield. There are so many yields at Garfield Community Farm and in any good permaculture uh, system. Unexpected yields, yields that, that the, the systems that, uh, that we've created and that we've allowed to be formed on our pieces of land, that those systems will give us, um, sometimes even when we don't expect it. Um, this year, one of the creative yields that my wife is working on um, is a drying of flowers. So there, there are just so many yields that we could talk about. So she's working on using the, the flowers in our yard to do pressed flowers and, and sell um, artwork uh, of pressed flowers. She, uh, she loves gardening, loves being out there. I'm kind of in charge of the food. She's taking care of the flowers now. It's, it's great teamwork that we have going. But the flowers make for better food, right? Make for more pollination happening, more beneficial insects at the farm. The fourth, uh, fourth principle, self-regulate and accept feedback. Um, by the way, let me know if I go too long. Usually going through the principles takes about three hours and I'm trying to do it in about 20 minutes. I think we're doing okay so far. Um, Self-regulate, accept feedback are, okay, thanks, Daryl. <laughs> um, so the, the photo on the left is a corrected experiment with something called Hugel culture. Raise your hand if you've heard of Hugel culture. I'm looking for people who have their screens on. All right, see some people saying yes. Um, Hugel culture is, is mound growing. That's what the word means, mound growing. And there's a, a farmer in Austria I'm blanking on his name, uh, Sepp Holzer. Sepp Holzer, he, he wrote a book a few years ago just called Permaculture. Um, and, and he did a lot of writing um, about his use of hugel culture. So what he does is take, take wood that, um, it's wood that is already rotting or wood that is just not very useful to him and his farm. He's got hundreds of acres hillside much of it forested and he takes these logs and he stacks them up you know at first he digs a, a pit stacks them up and then ends up creating these soil mounds with rotting logs underneath that are up to six feet tall he says 
So we were excited to try this out. He's very convincing in his book that it will work anywhere. And we didn't have the right materials to make it work. We didn't have enough wood. We would have had to cut down too many trees. Um, we, uh, you're supposed to use sod and I didn't, ha we didn't have sod and it would have cost a lot of money to go buy sod and it's almost impossible to get organic sod, right? So you take the sod and put it upside down on the top of these mounds and that holds things in place. So that was a problem. We didn't have the right materials. Uh, it ended up eroding away. It didn't work. We were discouraged, but we took that feedback that our, our soil and our hillside and our land uh, was was trying to teach us something else. We did have some wood, so we dug a pit, and we didn't mound it up more than six inches. Um, but it worked really well, and this was actually um, trying it out in a really sandy spot at my parents' cottage, which is along Slippery Rock Creek. The soil is really sandy there. Did the hugel culture. My mom had never been able to garden there. It just wasn't working. We um, put the soil on top of the wood, and she grew the best tomatoes that she'd ever grown at that location out at the cottage. Um, probably because the wood held so much moisture instead of the sandy soil just draining it away. Um, so it worked for us. We took, we took, we didn't give up. We took the feedback. We did it in a way that somebody else told us you shouldn't do it. Sepp Hol Holster was very clear. Don't, <laughs> you have to mound it this high. Well, that didn't work for us. We learned from the land. Um, we accepted that feedback from our land. The fifth principle is use and value renewables, renewable energy. Um, renewables can be so simple and save you money without costing you a dime, like hanging your clothes out in your backyard. So this is another picture of our backyard. And almost every sunny day, you'll see clothes hanging out in our backyard. And it takes work and discipline to do that but it reduces our gas bill. It helps us feel a little bit better about the amount of fracked natural gas that we use in our house. Um, and we hang up our clothes and our kids are learning how to do it and they hate it sometimes and complain that we make them hang their laundry outside, uh, but we do it anyway. Um, the picture on the right, it was, uh, I was on a bike ride on, on Hatteras Island out in the Outer Banks of North Carolina and I just, you know, I was riding down, I think it's Highway 12 that goes the whole length of the of those islands, riding down on a long bike ride and came across this community solar project. Read a little bit about it. It's really inspiring. It's a small solar farm that um, home, homeowners there can buy into. So there's several, uh, several homes that get their electricity from this solar garden. Um, Solar energy really has the potential to be a community, like Garfield Community Farm. There, there's great potential for community solar projects. Pennsylvania, it's been kind of slow going, but we're getting there where we're gonna be able to do these sorts of community solar projects soon. Um, really excited to see how permaculturists, like hopefully you all um, in years to come, uh, we'll put this into practice, uh, developing communities that create their own energy together. Um, this is at Marin Cook's house. She's a, uh, a urban farmer and activist, amazing woman in uh, the Frick Park area. She lives right on the edge of Frick Park. This is on her roof, actually. Um, and you can see the integration of gardening, of of Real, real permaculture gardening um, on her roof alongside solar panels. Her house, her yard, her roof, um, everything uh, is a learning opportunity. We go there during the permaculture class and spend nearly an entire day uh, um, at Frick Park and uh, on her property. It's amazing what you can learn in one urban lot, like one urban lot, one urban house. <clears throat> One of the challenges of permaculture for us all is to produce no waste. Um, from the beginning, it was about, as David Holmgren and, and Bill Mollison talked about, and Daryl mentioned, about closed loop systems, about understanding ecological systems um, 
that that really don't need outside inputs. I don't need to go to, uh, you know, we don't need to go to Frick Park and and try to fertilize the big oak trees that have been there for two hundred years. Like the forest has figured out how to do that, and evolution of all of those elements together, if there are limited invasives, um, have learned how to function together. So how do we? How can we mimic those closed loop systems in the systems that we create? Um, learning and, and incorporating uh, the local ecological system. So produce no waste, one of those, of course, absolute like mandatory things in a garden on a farm is to, to compost and to use all of the waste material that we can um, in a way that will nourish our soil. But there's so many other ways that we're continually challenged. How can we use this thing that, uh, th this thing that normally we would throw out, but maybe it has some use. Um, our green, we're building a new greenhouse right now, and it's almost all reused material or things that I've gotten off free list serves or from construction junction. So it feels pretty good. I even got the, the greenhouse plastic from construction junction. <clears throat> we try to do all of this designing from, from understanding patterns um, before we try to create detail. Uh, and this was this is one of the one of the principles. I, I love hearing Daryl talk about uh, this stuff because uh, as you'll see Daryl is is brilliant and <laughs> brings a lot of uh, nuance to to what it means to create from pattern to detail. Um, here's some some examples of thinking about patterns. I um, mean, really really simple example. A grid pattern um, takes up so much space, but if we understand triangular patterns, we can fit more plants into a garden bed. So that matters when you have a tiny little backyard. Um, how much you can fit into that tiny backyard matters. And if you use triangulation, you can fit more. Um, this is from a book called Gaia's Garden. Um, there's a lot about pattern and um, how more can be grown by using keyhole patterns um, and kind of mandala, or mandala patterns. Um, so we don't start with I want to grow this and this and this and this um, and then think about the patterns. Well, no, we need to think about the pattern first, the design first, and then we can think about how the details all fit into that. And the details can change. I've learned after doing this for over a decade, you learn that, well, the details, we don't want hot peppers this year as like we did last year, or the restaurant wants this and not that or um, the fruit trees now create a ton of shade. The patterns are still correct, but the detail of what, uh, what is growing in that forest garden um, changes. We integrate rather than separate. Um, this picture, I usually like to ask uh, when it's a smaller group for people to chime in what this might be. I'll let you look at it for a minute. Actually, go ahead and put it in the chat if you know what this is. I'll wait a second. Got any answers? I can't see the chat. You'll have to tell me. Uh, wind generation is the, the only guess so far. All right, I'm, I'm waiting. Wind Let's generation is a good one. We need some more. Yeah, can you, let's get a couple more guesses in there. Wind generation is is a really good guess. It's sort of, it's close, but not quite. Water turbine. Okay. Yes, the central piece is a water turbine and it's inside a water main. And this is being implemented in Portland, Oregon, where, I mean, you've got water flowing under uh, under all of our streets all the time. People are always using water. 
and it, water is energy right the flow of water is energy um, so they're putting these turbines into those water mains and creating electricity example of integration thanks everybody for uh for participating a little bit at least thinking about that another picture of um, integration so permaculture systems sometimes they look messy right and people are like i don't like permaculture because it just looks messy and sometimes it can um, but when we understand the craziness and the mess all then it it becomes beautiful to me um, and what we see here this is in this is actually in florida at a farm called echo um, they do training for farmers all over the all over the world really focusing on farmers in um, developing nations and what we see here is moringa um, comfrey and chaya and they're growing in a food forest system a multi-layered system where the the moringa which is the closest that'll actually get taller than anything else there but moringa is one of the most highly nutritious leafy green plants it's a tree and you can eat the leaves in a salad um, you can dry those leaves and make them uh, put them into pills and uh, in Africa, they call it the miracle tree because it can um, do so much to solve uh, malnutrition with the amount of, of nutrients in those leaves. The same with chaya. Chaya is from a different part of the world, but it grows in the same type of climate. That's way in the back. It's hard to tell exactly what you're looking at, but it's a shrub. And those leaves are also edible when cooked, highly nutritious, but it's a shrub. It's, it's going to grow lower does well in the shade of the moringa and then on the ground layer we have comfrey so they've integrated all of these things together and the comfrey really likes it cooler it does great up here in Pennsylvania and they're trying to grow it in Florida and it seems to be pretty happy but it probably would not be if it were not under the shade of those other plants so recognizing that integration of elements makes oftentimes for a healthier system we learned that this summer one of our volunteers um said why don't we let the chickens in the compost and i was like um i don't know why not because the compost is over there and the chickens are over there that's the only reason they're not integrated it was a a correction that we were able to make we were able to accept feedback from a volunteer who, you know, we're, we, we could feel like, oh, I should be teaching these people. I don't, we shouldn't take uh, correction from those who don't know what they're, they, of course we should. And it was a, it was a wonderful opportunity to, to try something different. So we put a compost pile in the chicken yard and the chickens have absolutely loved it. They go in there and they, they dig it up. Um, it can help aerate your compost. Um, they'll pick bugs out of it and and the worms that come in, they get more nutrition. They've actually been eating less of their food, I noticed lately, that we buy because they have so much uh, compost, <laughs> compostables that they're eating now. So it, again, integration rather than separation. Use small and slow solutions. Oh, I was gonna put a photo in here and I didn't. So imagine how you, <laughs> how you uh, might use small and slow solutions in these systems. This is an interesting one, I think, um, and it's so important and and beautiful, especially in urban permaculture, in community-based permaculture. At first, we moved really, really quickly to do some things and got ahead of where our people were. And so we've had to learn how to slow down and really include the community of people, um, our volunteers, our neighbors, uh, the churches that support the farm, we're a nonprofit, um, to make sure that people understand what's happening and why it's happening and what we're trying out, what we're doing. And sometimes we have to slow down um, and, and that's okay. And I think ecologically, small solutions just make sense because we're so used to big, immediate uh, solutions in our day that aren't really solutions. They just oftentimes create more problems. The use of fossil fuels is the perfect example. We can do anything. We do everything with the power of fossil fuels. That was the thinking 100 years ago. And now um, we're trying to go back 
it was trying to go forward in order to go back or to go back in order to go forward um, because we have lost this sense of, of valuing the smallest solution, not ignoring a problem, but finding the smallest uh, solution that takes less energy and less work. Okay, we've got just a couple more here. We use and value diversity fits right in with that idea of integration. So this is a photo of how you grow corn in a diverse landscape. So this is a hillside. There's so much detail that I could talk about in this picture and I'm not going to right now, but you can see an alleyway of corn um, on the downhill side. There's more of that plant Moringa, which is a, uh, I think it's a nitrogen fixer. Um, and then on the uphill side, oftentimes uh, there's all sorts of things growing there, but it's mostly nitrogen fixing trees, definitely on the uphill side. Um, there's nitrogen fixing trees that fertilize, uh, the corn. Um, you can see there's flowers growing there, all sorts of things. And this is again, an echo, um, in Florida where they're training farmers from around, uh, the developing world. What does that look like though in urban farming, in your setting, use and value diversity? Yes, it matters around plants, but it needs to impact all of our lives. Um, those with differing opinions, um, we live in a, of course, in a country fraught with, uh, with the struggle of racism. How do our how, do, how does our permaculture um, value the diversity of our neighborhoods and and our cities big questions to ask one example uh in terms of plants is uh right here we grow usually around 15 to maybe up to 20 types of tomatoes um each year and at first it was like it was just fun to do that i love i just kind of love diversity anyway so let's grow see how many we can grow and then um, we learned that every year there's, especially in Pennsylvania, some things don't do too well and we lose some plants um, because it's too wet one year or it's too hot and dry the next year. Um, and so the having diversity is really important because some plants do really well in, some, in, in one weather or one insect pressure really gets at the, who knows, the black crim heirloom tomatoes and they don't do well but the cherokee purples that look almost the same uh do great and then we took the those to a restaurant this is uh, a restaurant called salt of the earth that was in our neighborhood about five to ten years ago now um really great restaurant we took those in and we we could literally charge twice for a big pile of multicolored, multi-sized tomatoes from what we would if they were just all red, like looking like store-bought tomatoes. So there's there's much value in having that diversity. Value, you know, in our pocketbooks um, by having that diversity. The last two, we use uh, the edges and the margins um, and we find surprises in those areas. So where are the, what are the marginal spaces that oftentimes we might, we might completely ignore? They're not really a part of our garden or our, our neighborhood, or our lives. Um, the edges where sometimes things are a bit more wild than we're comfortable with. Um, at Garfield Farm, we found lots of value in in caring for the edges. Um, lots of different mushrooms that we've harvested that are completely wild. There are lots of blackberries coming into the edges, sometimes too many, and we have to manage that um, as they try to make their way into the garden spaces. Um, but, but we value those edges. And then finally, creatively use and respond to change. Um, this is a design that I did a couple years ago. This guy, um, long story, he ended up buying or being given property right next to his home that was completely bulldozed. Uh, so major immediate change and we needed to respond to that change. So we created this design um, that tried to, 
to 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 make those changes into a benefit there are lots of problems how can we see those problems become um, become beneficial so creatively use and respond to change we have about five minutes left do you guys want me to keep going into some urban permaculture stuff Daryl and Liz Um, there were a couple of questions that popped up in the chat. If you want to take a minute, um, That'd be great. Yeah, I was going to say the same. If we take a few questions and then you continue. Yep. I'm looking at questions here. I'm happy to read that out um, so that you can answer them, John. The Ooh. first question is: Is the compost the chickens are in then used on the veg beds? Yes, it will be. Yep. So uh, a follow-up question to that, are there any um, uh, concerns in terms of like animal manure onto the, the veg beds, um, ensuring that the heat temperature gets up to, or temperature gets up to a certain amount? Right, so what we'll do is we'll leave it all in there with the chickens for several months, allow it to break down, and wheelbarrow that out to another compost bed, bed where the chickens are not and let it continue to break down um it's a good question yeah thanks and then um oh so the yeah how long does it break down after that you said a couple of months well we're in month two of having that compost pile with the chickens so we'll see yeah <laughs> see if it's quicker than normal we haven't turned it at all we're just leaving it to them um to do to do the work right now so we'll see okay uh, other question, um, does the nitrogen that is fixed from the trees go downhill to the corn? Yeah, that's the idea. So it's um, it's a, a method that uses ni uh, perennial nitrogen fixers that can also be used as firewood. Um, and it that nitrogen will come downhill, yes, into the corn beds. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and again, for everyone else, if you wanted to put questions into the chat box, please feel free. There was one other question, I think, spurred on by one of your photos there. Uh, when mushrooms are growing on trees, are they compromising and killing the trees? <laughs> That's some, of, some of them are. Yeah. There's a lot of different kinds of fungi and mushrooms, and so like a honey mushroom is damaging the tree. Um, usually if you see a mushroom growing on a live tree, it's probably not that great for the tree. Um, but it's like shiitake, sulfur shelf, oysters, they tend to grow on dead trees. So the answer is both. <laughs> um, if we go a couple minutes over, I have a short video that I was going to show before we talk about urban permaculture. Do you want me to sh show the video and that could that could end us up for today? Or are we going to 8.30? We've got the 8.30, yep. Oh, well, awesome. Here we go. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen again and we'll watch that video and then get into a little bit more. John, just when you share your screen at the bottom, make sure you say audio from my computer. Uh, there's a little yeah. checkbox there. Thank you, yep. Twelve years ago, we had a vision to grow food on this land and to do it with the community and for the community of Garfield. Through a community of people, through hundreds of volunteers and neighbors, friends, and experts working with us, we've worked for 12 years to restore this land and to create an urban ecological farm where native birds that you can maybe hear, along with uh, traffic, goes by. We recognized 12 years ago that our neighborhood had some significant problems. 
people live on steep slopes in this neighborhood and there's no grocery store here. And so when we started the farm, we didn't just want to do ecological restoration. We really wanted to grow food for the people who live here and have low access. We teach a permaculture design course here at Garfield Community Farm. The focus is to train people in this ecologically beneficial way of farming. We also teach neighborhood kids through summer camps and school programs. University students come here and learn. We do field trips. Garfield Community Farm has a broad network of partnerships. We really could not do what we do without our partnerships. One of those partnerships is with a neighborhood organization called BASE. They bring their summer camp up here multiple times a week throughout the summer. We work with the kids and the counselors to create a curriculum that helps students engage with nature, engage with food and growing food, engage with nutrition. Um, it's been a, a gift to us to be able to work with these children from our neighborhood and hopefully it's been a gift to them. The primary mission of Garfield Farm is to produce as much food as we can for local families. We do this through a farmer's market that we have here, a vegetable subscription program, and through donations of produce in partnership with local churches. 2020 has been a challenging year for us all. We've been able to grow more food this year than ever before. We've had many volunteers, children and adults alike, coming to the farm, helping us grow more food and getting that food to more people in our community. In 2021, we hope to build a new greenhouse, grow more food for, for more people in our neighborhood, increase our production, and do more work with kids in the neighborhood who, uh, who need this sort of space, need to get their hands dirty, get outside and experience nature, right here in their own neighborhood. So that was a quick introduction uh, that we just made uh, a month or two ago um, for the farm that we thought we would show. We have three other videos that go along with that one. We'll maybe show one of the other ones later um, on Thursday. Yeah, open up another PowerPoint here. So we're going to be uh, just getting into kind of how are some of these principles active at Garfield Community Farm. And I would love it if Elizabeth and Daryl, if you would both just jump in with me at any point through this, because you all are, have been so influential um, in the farm. Um, we hired Liz uh, at the beginning, just before the pandemic started, and it it was a long time that we, we would hire somebody, we'd get really great people every summer, but we were never able to hold on to our, our staff, um, eat, you know, throughout the year. So every summer it would be hire somebody in May, get them acclimated. It takes at least six weeks to really get what's happening at the farm. Um, they get a month of feeling really good about their work and then they're, they're done by the end of the summer or by, by mid fall. And it just fe felt like it would be really good to have somebody year round. So we've worked out, um, we worked out over about a two year period, how we could raise the money to make that happen. And it's been amazing to have Liz on staff now, um, since last March, I think. Um, and I mean, what, what we hoped would happen was that we would be able to increase production this year. Um, and that happened and I mean what a, a great year to allow that to happen because we've been able to donate um, far more produce uh, through the food pantry at one of our partnering churches um, during the pandemic here than, than we have ever been able to do in the past um, so it worked out really well that uh, one of our goals we were able to meet that goal and and bring Liz on um, and so she's going to be working through the winter, which is the first time to have a production manager who's going to work with us um, through the winter. And hopefully, uh, she, hopefully she'll stick around with us for a long, long time. So in urban permaculture, 
I've, I've kind of pulled out three three things that I think are really important to urban permaculture. One is that we design for productivity. Urban areas um, need fresh organic produce. Um, and so production, hiring Liz for us uh, to focus on production, production is a really important thing for urban permaculture. And urban, urban farming can look like many different things. We'll see a couple of different examples. Um, for us, it, it it really looks like a kind of a smaller scale uh, uh, rural permaculture. We have we have an area that there's so much abandonment um, in our part of the neighborhood that it really feels like we're out in in a rural area at many times. Um, and so we can focus on production in ways that we might if we were at Three Sisters Farm out in Sandy Lake, Pennsylvania, or if we were somewhere in Butler County or Westmoreland County. Um, of course, we don't have 300 acres. We have about three acres. Yeah, I want to add a comment. I always say everybody doesn't need to be a gardener, but every neighborhood needs to have a garden mm -hmm. within reach. Yep. Yeah, it's been really rewarding to stick around and do this for over a decade because there are so many people who have started gardens and farms in the city of Pittsburgh, in suburban areas, um, because they've they've gotten their hands dirty at Garfield Community Farm or and and or at other um, local agriculture projects. So Garfield Farm is not just about what we do there, um, but also what's happening and how we're connected to this network in the neighborhood. I've done uh, designs for, f I don't know, five to 10 other families in the, in the Garfield and surrounding neighborhoods, like within a half a mile or so of the farm. So there's, there's places that we've been able to design, but then there's other places where people take, take tomato plants they bought from us and trees and pawpaw trees growing all over the neighborhood. Now we sold like, 50 pawpaw trees this year to people so that they're all over the neighborhood. I can't wait till they get a little bigger and I can go uh, steal some pawpaw trees off the seedlings that we started. Don't we get a right to that? If you start the seedling, we should map out where they all go. Hmm. Um, so yeah, productivity, uh, grow food, urban permaculture. Um, but with that, it's always, the design is always focused on people. And so at the farm, we're always thinking about how can we do more education, more restoration, and I'm thinking human <laughs> restoration back to nature and with, with, within ourselves, our, our own spiritual, emotional wellness, and our relationships. Restoration, how can that be happening through our permaculture? Um, and how can all of that, how can we be fostering connections for people? To nature, to to themselves, to um, to just a holistic wellness. Um, Liz, I I feel like you you have a lot that you could say on this. I was just thinking one thing with the transition between productivity to designing for people. One thing that um, that I learned at Garfield Farm this season was I came in, I was like, okay, I'm the production manager. I'm going to maximize productivity. We're in the city. I'm going to grow all this stuff right next to each other. But then I wasn't thinking about all the different people that come into the garden space and use that space and um, might not know that what's planted where and where the seeds are and um, I was like, oh, I don't think I made the pathways big enough for all the people that don't know what's here. Um, but yeah, thinking about connections, the partnerships have been really, I'm sorry for the background noise, that's my daughter. Um, the partnerships have been really interesting to me, thinking about, um, you know, individuals come and bring their food scraps and dump them in the compost bin. Um, so they're people that live in the city that don't have a place to make their own compost. So they bring their food scraps to the farm. Um, we go to a local coffee shop and pick up their coffee grounds to put into the compost. 
Um, we have partnerships in so many different ways with other, other organizations. Um, there's a nonprofit that plants trees. Their mission is to plant trees. So we've partnered with them to do some design work and to help um, plant trees in different areas. Um, just there are so many different ways because there are so many people around us and so many businesses around us in the neighborhood, um, even just people walking down the street. Um, Garfield, the way it's set up, it's three city blocks and one of the streets is open to traffic. So there are people that walk through the neighborhood all the time and when we're there working, they stop and talk to us and ask advice. Well, where can I get mulch material or what do you recommend for this? Or are you selling tomatoes? Um, so that's been just fascinating dealing with the people and, and fostering partnerships and connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it really is the most beautiful aspect of, of the project that we get to be a part of um, is, is the people. I missed your fall festival this year. Yeah, I missed Street it. party. Yep. Yeah, every fall except this year, but it's been a long time. We've been doing a, a big party in the fall, right in the in the street. Um, it's a great time, music and lots of food and pressing cider. Um, this is an example of of a space at the farm where it's really designed both for production and for people. Um, it's a a meditation labyrinth or a prayer labyrinth that you can walk into if you ever walked a labyrinth that's a it's designed to be a meditative space that you walk through i really i try to practice meditation myself but a walking meditation works really well for me to to move my body that's why yoga works so well so a labyrinth is is kind of like uh kind of like doing yoga you can focus on your breath but your body gets involved too um but within our labyrinth we also have um, lots of herbs that we harvest every single week for our CSA or for restaurants or for the market. And, um, and there's also tons of pollinator plants in there. It's just alive with, uh, with different sorts of insects and bees and pollinators, um, hummingbirds sometimes. Um, so people have come who've done other labyrinths and they're like, well, your labyrinth is small, but there's nothing else I've ever seen like this, where you walk and you're just enveloped in the smells of the herbs and um, the big bumblebees flying around and um, nobody's ever got stung in the labyrinth, which is good. Um, but um, it's it's really an example of a space that's designed for production and for people. Um, and for that like holistic wellness, a, a place of quiet, a place of calm, an intentional space um, to bring those elements together. Uh, Daryl, uh, Thursday, are you going to do some natural building or do we not have time for that? Um, perhaps. I wasn't really thinking a whole lot of that. So, yeah. This is a three hour class. Other class. than to mention that it happens in permaculture. Yeah. Well, here it happens in permaculture. This is a really fun example of doing some natural building. We, we made this with mostly six year olds, I think, um, stomping on clay, sand and straw. And we made this cob oven. It's a pizza oven made of material that some of it we pulled right out of the ground at Garfield Farm. Um, you make a fire in there and and make pizzas. So it's a really fun space um, for kids and adults to be able to um, be at the farm and, and make food and cook food. And it, in our community space is now this great space to gather. Um, this is a, a pandemic safe gathering where each family kind of has their own bench in this, in this setting. Um, we're actually doing a worship service in this in this photo because I see the bread and the wine there. Um, but uh, to have space to do education work and to have larger groups of people uh, is really important to us. 
And then the third piece um, that I, that I uh, wanted to bring up was the design for ecological restoration. And for us in urban permaculture, in our kind of urban permaculture, uh, any kind of ecological restoration is a good thing because we, we are on land that ha once had 25 homes on it. And every one of those houses was torn down. Most of the house just pushed into the basement, a little bit of backfill put on top. So when we started, it was three main invasive plants growing, Japanese knotweed, um, uh, Siberian elm, which is a tree, um, and well, I get lots of different vines, porcelain berry being one that we're struggling with right now. A lot of that. Um, so there wasn't much na much native going on on the land um, and and there wasn't much good good topsoil. So we had to do we've done a lot of work and have to continue doing a lot of work to be able to grow food. We have to do a lot of soil restoration work. Um, now there might be some urban permaculture that is is so urban that you're not really doing as much ecological restoration. You're, the, the, the ecologies that you're saving are the ones that don't have to be destroyed because you're growing food in a warehouse or in a, you know, on the roof of a skyscraper or something like that. And there are great examples of urban permaculture that are like that. But in the Pittsburgh, uh, Great Lakes area, you know, Detroit and Milwaukee and Buffalo, New York, the Rust Belt cities where we are, um, ecological systems are coming back right inside our cities because our populations have declined so much in many of the most struggling neighborhoods. So the people who need permaculture are in locations where the land and the soil needs permaculture also. Um, so we have an, a, a great opportunity there where there's land, it needs a lot of work, but there's not much happening on it. And we got a lot of land for a low price. <laughs> um, so let's see if we've got any pictures here. Just some, some nice fun pictures. That's in the labyrinth. Um, <clears throat> some, is that the bee balm or bergamot? I can never remember which is the red and which is the pink. That's the bergamot. Bergamot, all right. One story I like from Garfield Farm is the um, five line skink. Yes. That's a fun story. Uh, we had a, our compost pile and the kids were kind of playing in the compost. I don't know if they were looking for worms or what, but um, but they found this lizard and I'd never seen this this creature before. And so we caught this little, I, don't, I wish I, had, I have a picture of it, but I, I, it would take me forever to find it. We caught this little guy, he's about four or five inches long and it's a lizard with some yellow stripes on it and i took some photos of it went home looked it up and it's not supposed to be here in this part of pennsylvania it's that they don't supposedly they don't exist in allegheny county um so i kept digging and i found like a herp a herpology or something uh, what is the study of 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 reptiles is it herpetology herpetology okay found you know a a network of herpetologists and um and and they had a way that we could fill out some paperwork and officially uh let the scientists know that one was found in allegheny county so we got to do that and i mean isn't that cool that this creature was able to find a home and i've never seen one since but this creature was able to find a home at Garfield Community Farm. Normally they live in the south, so it's also an example of probably climate related migration of, of species um, due to climate change, but, uh, but it was pretty cool. <clears throat> um, at the farm, we're, we, we create a lot of wild pockets. Um, I'll read this quote, even though I'm I'm the one who wrote it. Sometimes I can write things better than I say them on the spot. We'll see if I did earlier today. I've found that urban permaculture includes the rec 
the recreation of wild pockets, both ecologically and within ourselves. So let that sink in for a second, not just in your garden, but in yourself. Permaculture can help urban spaces be home to wild insect and animal populations. It can also help children and adults have personal interactions of rewilding our hearts and our minds. So the first picture there on the top is right outside our bio shelter. There's this patch that we've had from the very beginning. It's connected to a swale. It can be a wet area, um, intentionally created wet, mini little wetland. Um, but it's wild. We just let it go. Right now there's a, um, a mulberry tree trying to grow there and I'm trying to decide if it should be there or not. But um, lots of wild flowers that grow in that little spot. And, uh, and now lots of goldenrod now, just full of pollinators and beneficial insects right in the middle of the garden. So I love to have in the middle or all around the edges of every garden, a wild place uh, like that. And then the lower picture is right near our home in Stanton Heights, there's a, there's a strip of woods and um, nobody was ever in those woods. I used to go down there, I still do, I go down to the edge of the woods and I have this little camping chair that I put my thermorest in. If anybody backpacks, you know what a thermorest is probably. I put it in there and that's where I read. Nobody comes back there. Nice green grassy hillside leads into the woods. And I made the mistake of showing the boys, my boys and their friends, like the woods, like, why don't you guys play in the woods? So they started playing in the woods at the beginning of the pandemic. And now it's like full of kids. It started with two and now it's just kids from all over, uh, building forts and digging holes and climbing trees, getting dirty and getting in trouble and having sword fights with sticks and you know what kids need to do. And city kids on computers these days often don't. So I think our permaculture can, it really, they really, it really needs to connect to the human, um, the human side of us humans. Um, and that is a connection to nature. Uh, there's also the possibility of working with a nonprofit that does tree planting and doing some restoration of that forest. Um, in Stanton Heights because it's very, there's almost no understory. Um, not because of the kids, <laughs> but because of the deer. Uh, cool thing, I think, uh, last week I, I heard a neighbor um, talking about uh, that there are coyotes down there. We have way too many deer here. And um, supposedly there's a coyote in the woods. Hopefully it doesn't find our chickens the neighborhood over, but we shall see. Anything you want to add to that stuff, Daryl or Liz? I know you both have unending stories of human connection to nature. And that, that in many ways, is the, the passion behind why you do what you do, as it is for me. Oh, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> You're pretty eloquent. <laughs> Um, this is our backyard. So just I just threw this picture in there to 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 remind us that permaculture in the city, um, the neighborhood farm influence. We want the neighborhood farm, neighborhood food production to influence the backyards. Um, and so when we when I te when we teach our permaculture classes, we might have the class focused in on Garfield Community Farm, but we spend plenty of time in people's backyards because that's where that's where all of us, well, not all of us, that's where many of us have an opportunity to, to really impact our own, our own self-sufficiency or communal sufficiency. Um, we can grow a bit of our own food. We can uh, support healthy pollinator populations, all of that. We can plant trees and fruit trees and all of that. So um, the backyard is, is an amazing place, especially in a city like Pittsburgh, where many of us have, you know, decent sized backyards. I just want to jump in and say we've got about five minutes uh, left for tonight. Yeah. I don't know uh, 
if you want to open it up for a few questions or if you had any last things you wanted to address great i i've got just a few more backyard pictures but really nothing else to say oh not a backyard picture example of vertical but i'd love to all three of us to be able to hear questions yeah, absolutely. Uh, folks want to find the chat box and enter any uh, questions you have from tonight. Um, yeah, I, just, I wanted to say when we um, pick up on Thursday, we'll start with a little more residential design and and use that to help illustrate some more detailed permaculture concepts like zone and sector design and approach to design how you how you look at a piece of land and start thinking about how to apply these principles. So, um, and then we'll take that to rural and community projects as well on Thursday. Um, while we're waiting for some questions, uh, uh, Christina, if you wanna drop the uh, evaluation in the chat box as well. Um, again, just to reiterate for folks, if you wouldn't mind just doing uh, the quick evaluation. Um, now, while we wrap up or, or afterward, open up the link. Um, If, um, well, we wait on some questions, I would throw one that I have out there for, for I guess, for all three of you. Um, what do you find is the, you know, you mentioned a lot of resources and books and trainings. Um, what would you say is the a good next step for somebody who wanted to go a little bit deeper on, on any of these subjects or, or permaculture uh, more broadly? Um, one thing I've learned in recent years, I was never, I still don't watch a lot of YouTube videos, but there is so much information now about permaculture out there. Um, there's the permaculture um, podcast. And there's, there's just a lot of resources online. Um, Scott Manns from Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania, he's a Slippery Rock graduate, but he started the permaculture podcast years ago. And he has some really good interviews of David Holmgren and other you know, let's lots of people um, look up, you know, the various permaculture institutes besides the Permaculture Institute of North America, China, that Liz and I are involved with. There's another um, more grassroots permaculture institute called with the website permaculture.org. And then there's a global permaculture, which is a or permacultureglobal.org, which is an international network. A lot of resources and information. Okay, great. John or Liz, anything else you would throw into that? I think that everybody comes to permaculture for a different reason and with a different background. And everybody also has their own ways of learning. Um, so there's, you know, if, if you want just a, a broad overview of what permaculture is, um, the book Gaia's Garden by Toby Hemingway is a, a really good um, basic overview. It's a, a nice, short, easy read with great illustrations, great pictures. So Gaia's Garden is a good resource. And also just connecting with the people around you. Um, most places have a, a permaculture group within a, a small radius or, or somewhere nearby regionally. So connect with people that are doing it and, and just start having conversations. The, the classic answer would be to do a permaculture design course. Um, and the cool thing is that you can learn permaculture design anywhere um, and apply the design principles anywhere. So um, Liz, did, where did you get your PDC? I took mine in Hawaii. It was through a group called Living Mandala, and the teachers were Penny Livingston Stark. Um, she's probably the most um, well known of the the teachers that I took it with. Yeah, was at an intentional community on the Big Island. Right. I did mine at a really boring place called Pittsburgh, um, <laughs> but my teachers are Daryl Fry, Elizabeth Lynch, and one other woman Juliet um, and uh, that was great for me uh, six or seven years ago that I did that 
after starting Garfield Community Farm really is uh, a well-designed um, curriculum to go through an 80-hour course. Uh, you, you come out feeling really equipped to move forward. Um, we did have a question here from the chat. Uh, wondering about permaculturalists opinions on vertical farming uh hydroponics and aquaponics i have strong opinions on these things but <laughs> i mean there's aquaponics is cool that it's um they say it's more you get more vegetable production than fish necessarily but there's lots of different ways to design but in the, the chemical hydroponics where the people have to wear hazmat suits and goggles and heavy duty gloves to mix the chemicals to grow food versus making compost and growing food. There's just no comparison. You're either using local resources to create food or you're mining, you know, harsh chemicals and endangering workers. So, um, but, you know, honestly, there's lots of paths to, um, you know, local food production. And even though I have strong opinions, I, you know, things change and hydroponics evolves and aquaculture evolves. So I wouldn't paint a broad brush to criticize anyone's system. I just personally prefer to know, you know, more organic natural systems. And um, so that's my opinion. And I would say that um, it, it just depends on how you do it. And as a permaculturist, I, I do everything by the 12 principles and the ethics of permaculture. So how that looks and what the details of that are, it could take any shape. I could do anything using those principles and the ethics. So um, when I took my PDC, I toured a place that was an aquaponics farm that did everything organically and naturally. They had fish tanks and then the water went into their, their vegetables and um, everything that they fed the fish was organic and, and wholesome and came from on site. Um, so it just, it depends on how it's done. But yeah, going back to the principles and the ethics is always, always key to informing our actions. Just to put a call back into one of our, uh, we had a series on integrated pest management earlier this summer, and one of our uh, speakers was talking just about the, the resilience in uh, more natural soil based and, and open air systems and that some of the hydroponic and controlled environment systems in general are a little less resilient um, to, to pests and outbreaks and things like that. So you're, you're creating a much more uh, a less resilient system. So. Um, so we're we're a couple minutes over time here. Um, so I want to uh, we'll end questions for tonight. If you have additional questions, we'll have time uh, again on Thursday. Uh, Christine, I'm going to have you drop the evaluation in the chat one more time. Um, that will go away as soon as you log off. So please do open the link uh, before you log out. Uh, I want to thank our speakers uh, for this evening, and we'll uh, see all of you here again Thursday evening at seven. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.